Hi folks, welcome back to Through Scottish Prison. I hope you and yours are well. We just thought we'd start it different and to, to honour our former First Minister, who was treated wonderfully well by the North Macedonian government and soldiers in full military uniform, a proper send-off. And we'll talk about what he didn't get when he came home and what he did get. Anyway, let's bring in our guest tonight. First, I'd like to say that uh, Lloyd is down with the COVID, has got our Lloyd, so he's unable to make it with us today, but we have the Coatbridge Cavalier. How are you doing, Phil? Hey, I sound sound. That was very moving, actually, to see that um, and how that man should be treated. Very moving indeed. Yeah, I've, I've, I've got a big lump in my throat. It's very hard. I've watched it so many times, but every time I get a lump in my throat, and, uh, and up there in Click Manning, our favourite lawyer, our Eva. Eva, how are you? Hiya, Roddy. I've never seen so many grown men cry as I've observed this past week. It's been heartbreaking, depressing and uplifting all in all, all at the same time. Yesterday, particularly in Aberdeen and off up to Fraserburgh, was one hell of a roller coaster is, is all I could say and I hope that the big man was looking down and watching it and, and enjoying every minute as yeah. he should. Absolutely and uh, up in Dundee to, we've got Alan Petrie to join us today. Alan my friend how are you? Hi, I'm not too bad. Uh, unfortunately I couldn't make Aberdeen yesterday for caring commitments but uh, I'd like to thank everyone who did some recording so that we could all take some part in this and I would also like to thank Eva and Matt for making sure that we, Annie and Dave Lowell, was able to go on the, the the escort. Yeah, that must have been a heck of a trip. <laughs> well, two of the two of the wonderful uh, stalwarts of the movement. Fantastic, well done, Eva. Um, but uh, just to take on that, I mean, he was treated abominably by the British government, but I think that might just come back and bite them in the bum. Even the national. Um, who have been not the best to them, have said no way to treat a former First Minister. And I tell you what, Eva, I couldn't agree more. Um, it was, but at least the pilot, Techie, can you stick up the pilot? He did a wee love heart landing. Um, well, I'm well up again. Um, which was a nice touch, Eva, yeah? I think it was Leanne, where experience as an air traffic controller, that first uh, drew my attention to the fact that, that the pilot had created a heart in the sky. And I think it spoke for everybody in Scotland. Political beliefs and views aside, Scotland understood, particularly yesterday, the enormity of our loss. <laughs> We've lost a man who always had Scotland's back. Uh, he was Mr. Scotland abroad, just like when Ewing was Madame Ecos. For as long as Alex Salmond was there fighting and battling for your corner, you knew perfectly well that you had a vociferous, capable presence on the international stage. And that you know, he died doing what he loved best, promoting Scotland and talking about the benefits of independence, the need for independence, the desire for it, speaking about our nation and, you know, speaking about our history, our culture, our, our beliefs. Um, I, I, one day I'll be able to look back on what happened in the course of the last few days, particularly yesterday, and be able to write about it and look at it dispassionately. At the moment it is so raw that it's, it's sore, but it's also very positive in terms of what the people saw and what the people wanted to see. I arrived in, in Aberdeen yesterday at the airport and there was already a wee crowd of the Yes Bikers gathering and the crowd got bigger and it got louder and the car started arriving and the police were there trying to move people out into safer places because far more many people had turned up than had been expected and eventually there were something of the order of 50 or so Yes Bikers and when Alec arrived and the hearse came out, we had uh, the bikers in the front and then Alec and then the family and then the cars. And I think that the whole procession was about two and a quarter miles long because there were so many people that were there to pay their respects. 
But, but for me, the moving thing, although there were lots of us there to see Alec, what was exceptionally moving and completely unforgettable was the number of folk that were on the road waiting to see Alec as we drove by. So when we went from Aberdeen to Fraserburgh, at first it was one of these things that it started off as a whisper and it got louder and it became a roar the nearer that we got to Fraserburgh because the numbers increased and the presences increased. So you went from people lying in the streets in Aberdeen and car parks and spaces in the middle of nowhere to roundabouts until we got to Mint Law and the, the roundabout in the middle of Mint Law in the midst of uh, Alex's constituency. I don't know how many folk were out there, but it felt like the whole town were there to pay their respects and people were clapping, they were cheering, they were shouting, they were waving because they wanted to just pay homage to really the greatest of men. And when we came out of Mint Law and we arrived in Fraserburgh, by that stage, I was in, obviously in the car with Matt driving and I was sitting in what we call Alex's seat, the passenger seat, and we had some cargo in the back because we'd be Annie and Big Dave Llewellyn. You know, <laughs> who else do you want where you on a homage like that? And as we were driving forwards and we, we got to Fraserburgh about maybe a quarter of a mile out, we thought, oh, God, look at the number of folk there because there was an awful lot of folks standing at the roundabout at the start of the town and we realised there was a pipe band and they were playing Flower of Scotland as... Alec was driven into the town. People were singing, they were crying, they were waving, there were, you know, bagpipes, um, just an absolutely enormous turnout for him. Both sides of the street lined, people applauding, waving, cheering. That was the, the mark of the man that the people were out on the streets for him. No matter what governments or dignitaries had or hadn't turned up, no matter what arrangements were or were not made for him, the ordinary folk that he had spent his life fighting for and arguing for and championing were out there in their droves to pay respect to them. And there was there was several points actually in the journey where there were people that were at the roadside who stood up as we were arriving. I think we were maybe four or five cars back behind the hearse, so they were maybe in front of us. They were standing up, men taking off their hats, postmen in the midst of their rounds, standing still, taking their hats, doing a bow as, as Alec passed by. Farmers uh, sitting on wee seats, standing up, taking off their hats, bowing, waving, cheering, and just... I, I can't describe to you the absolute groundswell of complete, total love, admiration, respect for the man. It was honestly overwhelming and the lovely thing about it was that the family gained so much solace out of that you know in the midst of their loss they really understood and realized just how much Alec the gaffer the boss Ek Urek meant to everybody it was a phenomenon that I just I can't adequately describe it was just an emotion that was very, very worthwhile seeing, observing, and a major privilege to be part of. Um, as, as we went through Fraserburgh and we arrived at the Undertakers, people were clapping, they were they were singing, um, they, were, they were cheering them, because although we were broken hearted, at the same time there was a feeling amongst everybody that you had to mark the moment by celebrating the life of a man who transformed the country and you know, I was I was saying to Gail and, and Christina, his Alex's sister and his niece, they were talking about how grateful they were that people had travelled a great distance to be there. And I was trying to say to them, I didn't have the right words, but I was trying to explain, look, this isn't about how far people have travelled to see Alec. That's important. But the reason why people have travelled so far is the very fact that Alec and his endeavours and his achievements brought Scotland forwards. Alec made Scotland travel forwards. Alec made Scotland into a different place. He transformed us. You know, the first for 300 and odd years that dragged our country into the 21st century and made us believe. He gave us back that hope. We were disillusioned, we were challenged, we were disappointed, and he turned all of that into hope and a belief, a self-belief in our nation 
and that was the mark of the man. And those folk who didn't vote for him, who never voted for independence, who didn't believe in self-determination for our country, they too see the huge, enormous hole that is left in the very soul of our country by the loss of a man who, in time to come, will be lauded as the greatest political operator and the greatest of Scots in modern times. That's what he was. I don't have the words to, to, to do him justice. But by goodness, yesterday, the people of the northeast of Scotland certainly did. It was a privilege and a pleasure to be there, despite the saddest of days. Yeah, it is. We can probably finish this podcast now, Eva. Oh, fantastic description of what happened. But the other thing, I mean, as I say, he was treated so well, Alan, by the people of Macedonia. And the ex-president was there to see him off. And yet, when he came to his Scotland, the country, as Eva's described, he's done so much for. The Scottish government couldn't even send a couple of motorbike policemen to make sure he got out the airport on the road and to safety. And it was down to the Yes bikers and the Yes movement. Justice for our independence is going to be down to the people, not to anyone else. Yeah, I mean, I've got to take my hat off and really thank the people of North Macedonia for giving Alec the dignity and the respect that he, the man deserved. It's just a pity his own country, the country of his birth, the country he's done so much to improve, couldn't reciprocate. I mean, all we were asking for was Alex's body to be brought home, and we had to rely on the generosity of Tom Hunter. And I would like to thank him as well for showing that humanity. Despite the fact he didn't agree with a lot of things that Alex said, he is a human being and appreciated what Alec did. And the governments should have been doing this. It just it is ridiculous that there is no precedent set for bringing a son of Scotland back to the home of his birth. A man who served this country for so long, not just as First Minister, but also as an MP and an MSP. It was just dis disgraceful. I mean, if you go back to when Margaret Thatcher died, £3.6 million pounds worth of taxpayers' money was spent on Margaret Thatcher's funeral. 3.1 of that was uh, for the policing and security alone. And this nonsense about the RAF only being used for royalty. I remind you, when Diana died, she was no longer a member of the royal family. She was flown back uh, by uh, the RAF and it was BAE 46, uh, 146 aircraft of the Royal Squadron. So that blows that excuse out of the water as well. Although, personally, I don't think Alec would appreciate it being brought back in a, an RAF who have been so uh, helpful to a genocidal regime. But I would really like to thank Tom Hunter and yeah. the Yes Movement and the people of Scotland are so appreciative of this. So thank you, Tom, and thank you to the people of North Ma Ma Macedonia. I hear you. And of course, um, Phil, um, the sadness is everywhere. But it was the fact that um, Tom Hunter, I don't know when he said he didn't agree with things Alex said. I mean, he, I suppose a unionist who does this when the, the SNP Scottish government won't do anything to lift the finger to the man who made the party more than anyone. Um, it was quite despicable the way that they behaved, but it was great the way the Scottish public reacted. It is the striking message here. <laughs> Uh, is, is while the governments didn't turn out, or the big council that the Scottish government currently is, but the people did, and that was uh, that was wonderful. Uh, what, 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 the description and the appraisal of what actually happened and how this all unfolded from Eva was very, very touching, and <clears throat> it, it reminds me of, of what we were talking about last week. You know, this is. You can't believe it. But his body was returned to Scotland, right? And it took a private individual, Tom, Sir Tom Hunter, respect him, to pay for the flight after the, the rejection of the RAF um, by the government. And he, and Alex did what he... He died doing what he, he's done all his life and committed his life to. He delivered a speech on Scottish independence, collapsed after it in North Macedonia and sadly passed away. And while the UK and Scottish government's been talking about it, and steps uh, to him and says, no, nah, none of this nonsense here. Respecting respect, David Davis, 
the Conservative MP and close friend. He led calls for the armed forces to get involved, but nobody did, and, and, and obviously it had to be done. And I mentioned last week something, and I'll be honest, this is something I'd thought about for a while, Rudyard Kipling's If. And uh, uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to try it because... I, I, for me, it is the most appropriate. If you consider Rudyard Kipling's "If" as if Scotland herself were addressing one of her sons, and you listen to these words and how this man behaved and how he and it describes his life, it's quite striking. Let, let's let's try because I've got to try. It was worth. He's worth the fight. He's worth. He's worth. He, he, he marks everything that's best about us, imperfect as we are, imperfect as we are. So here we go. If you can keep your head while well, all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you, if you can trust yourself when all men doubt you, but make allowance for their doubting too, if you can wait and not be tired by waiting or being lied about, don't deal in lies, or being hated, don't give way to hating. And don't look too good, nor talk too wise. If you can dream and not make dreams your master, if you can think and make not make thoughts your aim, if you can meet with triumph and disaster and treat those two impostors just the same, if you can bear to hear the truth you've spoken, twisted by knaves to make a trap for fools, or watch the things you gave your life to, broken and stoop, and build them up with worn out tools. If you can make one heap of all your winnings and risk it on one turn of pitch and toss and lose and start again at your beginnings and never breathe a word about your loss. If you can force your heart and nerve and sinew to serve your turn long after they are gone and so hold on when there is nothing in you except the will which says to them, hold on. If you can talk with crowds and keep your virtue, or walk with kings, nor lose the common touch, if neither foes nor loving friends can hurt you, if all men count with you but none too much, if you can fill the unforgiving minute with sixty seconds worth of distance run, yours is the earth and everything that is in it, and which is more, you'll be a man, my son. That, that that speaks volumes to me because we know we know it. Very few, in my opinion, in life that I've met or known or had the privilege to know have earned such an accolade. Well, gay few and they're all did. Got it. I mean, uh, if you notice, uh, in the UK are the only people who are perfect and don't have any human flaws, if you're to believe the crap that they're writing now. But... This way that the, the Unionists and their opponents and the Scots-born English nationalists are behaving, uh, Eva, could it be backfiring on them? I sincerely hope so, because at the beginning of the week you saw the hypocrisy, the utter and absolute abject, barefaced, shamefaced tributes coming from, and I'm going to name them, Pete Wisher, Stephen oh. Flynn, Brendan O'Hara, in the House of Commons, paying tribute to the greatness of Alex Salmond, when the man was alive, they had either nothing to say or they had only bad things to say. And then they watched the way the wind was blowing and they understood the enormity of the loss of our nation. And at that point, they decided to stand up. Well, there was a couple of days of this utter indecency when they were talking about the man. And they've gone silent because they've realised that they've been rumbled the people were watching and the people understood there was a massive difference, as, as Phil has just recited, between being a man of the people and looking at the likes of these folk. They weren't fit to lick his boots. They didn't defend him when he was alive. They were either silent or they criticised him. And once he had died, suddenly they were all jumping forward, you know, jockeying for position to pay homage to him. They should have done it when he was alive. The fact that they didn't speaks volumes. And what's even worse is that that bloody stupid, they think the likes of us didn't have the ability to rewind and do a wee Google search and dig out all the quotes and all the things they said when they were criticising him and what he did. P. 
Pete Wisher should be at the front oh. of the queue when they're handing out, honestly, the dishonours for his conduct. Now, we're not going to turn this into a poetry programme, but sometimes poems say it all. I was breaking down again when Phil was speaking, but a, a thing that got me during the week was Charlie Abel, who, as you know, was one of Alex's friends from Aberdeen. Charlie, fantastic singer, songwriter, great proponent of music and the power of music, uh, particularly big in terms of teaching children the joy that there is to be found in music. And, and Charlie, a man who uses the Doric to, to, to great extent and power, he wrote, we will remember. Fin you drive across a bridge without having to pay. Here we smile and thank Alec. Fin your bairn grows up and goes to university and doesn't pay for a degree. Smile and thank Alec. Fin you didn't hate to pay for your NHS prescription. Smile and thank Alec. Files you drive effortlessly around the Aberdeen bypass. Smile and thank Alec. When you party in the street on Independence Day on a new chapter of Scottish history, prosperity for Scotland. Smile and thank Alec. The future is ours if we follow his example and we deliver the dream. We owe it to future generations. We owe it to his memory and all those that went before him. We owe it to ourselves. Our hearts go out to Moira and the family and his many closest friends who worked with him daily to deliver good for all of us. Please take comfort in knowing that a nation, a nation grieves with you. The dream will never die. That's the epitaph for the greatest of men and he's leaving folk like Wisher and O'Hara and Flynn standing. At Winnie Ewing's funeral service a few months ago, Alec Neal said, in a thousand years, they'll still be talking about Winnie Ewing. Well, in a thousand years, they'll still be talking about Alec Salmond and how he changed Scotland for good and forever. And that is the memorial that that man has deserves to have worked hard for it and he'll go down in history as one of the greatest Scots in modern times. The others that have criticised him, that have bad-mouthed him and have suddenly woken up to understanding how loved and how respected Alec was, these people won't even merit a mention in the bibliography and that's where they deserve to be consigned to the dustbin of history. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, they do, especially one in particular. Um, there was, we were talked about it, the hypocrisy of them all there, Alan, but there was Swinney, who just happened to be signing a book of condolences. Unfortunately, someone took a photograph that he could put it on Twitter, showing himself looking so absolutely. Um, but here, if he's serious and genuine, he should be waiting a respectable time and he should be getting in touch with Colette Walker, with Kenny McCaskill, and say, seen the error of our ways, or what's he do, every word he wants to use and say, Let's put our heads together and get this done for Alec. That's what he should be doing. Let's hope he does do it, Alan. The hypocrisy is off this, off the planet. I mean, you've never seen anything like this at all. Now, John Swinney's sitting there signing a condolences book. Why didn't he sign off the information that Alec required at the Parliamentary Committee? That's what he should have been doing. He shouldn't have been redacting that. He should have been giving all the facts so as Alec's name could have been cleared properly. Not just in a court of law, but in public opinion. That's what you should be doing instead of covering up for these people. Uh, Stephen Flynn gives a great speech in the House of Commons, telling us how wonderful Alec is. But his father, who is the leader of Dundee City Council, will not even lower a flag in Alec's memory. Every single council chamber should have a book of condolences for Alec, not just the Scottish Parliament. There's many people who wish to show their respect to Alec who can't afford to go up to Edinburgh to sign that. And I know Alba has got uh, an online one, but a lot of people can't go online to do that either. But this hypocrisy is just off this planet, and it really angers me. These people hounded Alec right to his death, and Alec only asked them one, one favour. One favour is all Alec asked of them, and that was to put the country before their party and vote SNP 1, Alba 2, and we would have had a super majority and we would be sitting here speaking in a free land now if they had done what Alec had asked for that time. 
They're sucking me. It's, um, you know, the great thing, you know, you've heard me saying it often, Phil, I don't believe in coincidences. But on the day Alex coming home, the writer of The Vow, Mr Murray Foote, the CEO of the SNP, resigns on the same day. Was it a case of job done? Um, I've destroyed it. The the leader of the yes people is dead and coming home. I can go back now to normality. It's no coincidence that he resigned on the same day. Uh, no, I don't think so. This is a, a this is an indicator of the betrayal of the SNP, uh, the current management of the SNP, and the sellout, the people that have got involved the, to transform or try to change the whole raison d'etre of the SNP, which once was independence, nothing less. And that's what it should be. That, that's who, that's what made the SNP great. Uh, it's what Alec built. And to see it taken away like this and, and the turncoats taking control was, was is, is sickening. And this guy, we're well rid of him, but yeah, it's, it's, it's very much job's done. You know, the the shysters are left in control. The lunatics have taken over the asylum. If you're thinking that these people want independence, you're crazy. They, they, they're judge their actions, not their words. So it's been, it's been, you know, it's all everything's been in very, very poor taste. Everything we've seen described, the behaviour of the government, the behaviour of some of these shysters, and the lies that have been told. And John Swinney Swine in that and signing that book. Gives me the book. Uh, Swinney needs outed. Nicola needs outed. The Alphabetis and all her, st all, all Nicola staff, all involved in the stitch up of Alex Salmon needs outed. Can't hurt Alex anymore. And um, do you know what? There's a price. Sorry, Moira, but there is um, there's a price that needs to be drawn here. That has to be the truth has to come out. To to show to illustrate people just who your friend is and who's not your friend and, and a measure of a friend is one who defends you when you're not in the room this cannot be said for any on that list of shysters that, that evil listed or any of the rest of these gets who just who 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 spouted the the line that Nicola dictated, and turned on on the person that made that gave them the opportunity and made us all, uh, gave us all the opportunity to have the privilege and honour of representing the people. That that fact has been forgotten so quickly that these individuals look after their own glory and their own self interest rather than remember why they were why they were voted in in the first place to represent the people and do as as Alan says represent the people your country do for your people do for your country what Alec asked put them first not you that that is a core message another critical message that we were taught by this very very fine man um this exceptional human being um this not an angel <laughs> uh, maybe now but uh, in, in life you know he he, he was human he was human, and, and I guess that's why he related so well to so many people. He, he, he was he was exceptional, but um, I think the behaviour and the metric by which we measure individuals, uh, we reconsider that, we look at how that man acted versus these shysters, and for me, they, they just pale into insignificance, as Eva has already pointed out. Yeah. Murray Foote going the same day. I mean, they're also talking at the moment, Eva, that two of the people who replaced Murray Foote is Kirsten Oswald or Ian Blackwell. Um, it doesn't seem there's going to be any change of direction, but Murray Foote resigning the same day as Alec comes home, coincidence or not? Well, yesterday, travelling from my home to Aberdeen was very sad. Travelling from Aberdeen to Fraserborough we were driving through a valley of tears. We were in a car on both sides of the road, surrounded by people who were breaking their hearts and applauding at the same time, because as I said earlier, they recognised the greatness of the man, as, as, as Phil has said, a very special and exceptional human being. And to look at what he built 
in the party that he considered to be the vehicle to deliver the most precious of gifts to Scotland, that independence, that self-determination, to look at that vehicle and to see how it has fallen, it has crumbled, it has turned in upon itself, it has become decayed, it is rotten, there is a smell around it, it is a very, very bad set of circumstances to see. The SNP is beyond repair, and I wish I wasn't saying that. I wish I was able to talk about some sort of unity within the movement or speak about in 26, we'll have a campaign where you vote for one party on the list and a different one in the constituency, and we'll do a supermajority and Scotland will live happily ever after. That is not the way it's going to be because the people that are in the forefront of that party now, in comparison to Alex Salmon's stature, his ability, what he actually delivered, these people are no marks but they're worse than being no marks. They don't just keep our country static or standing still. They take us backwards in what they say and what they do and how they perform. You know, an example of this is yesterday, Gillian Martin, acting energy minister because Mary McAllen is on maternity leave. Gillian Martin was in Grangemouth doing press releases and videos and we Twitter shoots about how the staff in Greensway, the staff, the workers, the folk who are going to lose their jobs, you know, stop using sanitised language. Let's tell the truth in simple terms. The men and the women at the Greensmouth plant who are going to lose their jobs when the refinery closes to take their hat off to the SNP, to the Scottish government, because they're going to get retrained at Forth Valley College to do different jobs when the refinery closes. Look at the bigger picture. The fact is, the SNP have done nothing, bugger all, to keep that refinery open and they are content to stand idly by and watch as the refinery closes and the, the olive leaf that they proffer to the workers is, oh, you can go up the road to the college, we're going to retrain you. And the skills that you had there will turn them into some other kind of different skill. Meantime, those folk who are losing their jobs, some of them are not waiting for the redundancy payments, the redundancy notices, the P45s, the misery and the uncertainty and the hassle and the strain and the worry that comes with that. They're looking for other jobs and many of them are going abroad. They're going off to work in the Middle East where their wages are four, five, ten times what they would have earned here. But that's a brain drain. And the, 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 the experience and the ability, the training, the knowledge that these people had in Grangemouth is going abroad. It's leaving Scotland. Gillian Martin is enabling and actively encouraging that. And that's the problem with the SNP government. They're not trying, not for one bloody minute, are they trying to keep Grangemouth open, to renew and rebuild and maintain the refinery. They don't see the bigger picture. And if they do, they're willfully blind to it. They don't understand. Grangemouth has been there for 100 years. It was built there because of the skills of the workforce. And they're enabling those skills to depart, to diminish, to go abroad, to leave. Forgetting about future generations, forgetting about what our country needs. And they are absolutely and completely bought into and tied into a Westminster-centric frame of mind. The photos are there for all to see. Gillian Martin and Ed Miliband sitting there signing contracts, signing away Scottish energy, Scottish potential, Scottish value, Scottish jobs, Scottish lives, signing them all the way to GB Energy with a big beaming smile on her face. You know, hell mend you, Gillian Martin. By God, you have sold your country out for what? 20 pieces of silver? What's next? Who's going to be the first SNP to get in the House of Lords? Will it be her? Well, who knows? Who knows? And I can just confirm what you're saying. I'm, I'm in Dubai just now, folks. And it's my wee granddaughter, my youngest granddaughter's second birthday. And we had a party for her. And the amount of Scots that were there, as Eva says, and they're all in senior positions. 
in the oil industry uh, and in finance and another, and they left to better their life and they have a much better life here. They should be having that at home. We should be one of the wealthiest countries in the world. Well, we are one of the wealthiest countries, but we should be giving that to our people, not to the spibs in London, not selling out. We've discussed on here about GB Energy. It's nothing more than a hedge fund. And she's sitting there with a big smile on her face, Alan, signing off to a money-making uh, exercise for the spibs in London. Is she stupid or uh, does she not realise what that is? Stupid, maybe. Paid off, yes. I mean, the SNP are not interested in anything Scottish. They will just do what their paymasters down in Westminster tell them to do. And that's what our problem is. It used to be a case where the SNP led through the heart, not the mind, the heart. And they wore their heart firmly on their sleeve. But now they're doing everything through the wallet. It's If they could give us a little bit more uh, credence, a little bit more power, and fill our pockets up with as much of their English gold as they possibly can. That's what they'll do. Because they are not interested in for, uh, putting for Scotland first. I mean, e even on the Grangemouth, I mean, Eva's right. And it's not just the SNP, it's Labour. I mean, the Labour Party told us during that election, vote Labour, we'll save Grangemouth. Yeah. But we should all remember the fat Scottish Labour itself is a lie. We should have knew they should not be trusted because Scottish Labour do not exist. They are an accounting agency of the British Labour Party. And it's time the people of Scotland woke up to this. They've taken the cold weather payments from our pensioners. They've kept the Tories two child benefit cut. They're not interested in the people at all. They're just interested in further their own political career. Well, the people of Scotland in 2026 put them out of a job. Vote for real independent candidates. Independence for independence. Real SNP independent candidates. ISP candidates. And anyone who is standing with independence firmly on their, heart, on their sleeve, that's who you vote for. Because that's the only people that are going to take this country to freedom and save our industries. I hear Here, here, Alan. Well said. Um, here's the thing. Just You're an expert on oil and gas, Phil. Um, but here's the thing, we spoke earlier at the start, they said, oh, we can't bring Alec home because it costs 600k. Well, we can't pay away the fuel payment because of this, but they're closing down the range mouth and we'll get a pittance. But they can spend, and they can send 3.6 billion to Ukraine to fight a war against Russia. They can find money to help Israel with their genocide. But they can't find the money to save Grangemouth. They can't find the money to bring home a former first minister. The people need to wake up. We are a colony and we've been treated as such. Yeah, and we need to wake up to that fact and then do something about it. That that's the point, and this is why Gillian Martin, who I know pretty well, and it wasn't it wasn't a bad person, but she's she's clueless on such matters, and is serving her own self interest and her own career rather than doing what Alex did and put the people first. So the workforce, yes, I'm one of that workforce. Um, the brain drain from Scotland. Uh, Oil and gas, most of us, most of the people I know in the oil and gas industry are no longer in Scotland. They work all around the world, they have done for decades, had done for a very, very long time. We really, really should have got our act together. They, and the reason we've got to leave is because the oil and gas industry um, and even renewable industries and energy industries in Scotland, in UK, but in Scotland in particular, um, are not investing in research and development. And that's what kept us ahead of the game. The reason that Norway is thriving is because they are investing in research and development. The direct current power from power from shore, be it uh, the, the, every barrel counts, be it desalination, uh, be it uh, and using. Um, uh, there's there's so many different. You can pressurise the wells. There's so much technology out there, uh, and we're heading into deeper waters and rougher waters, and we're doing it safer and more efficiently than we've ever done it in the past. Um, and then, of course, we, what we really should be doing is building Grangemouth as a modern refinery, which uh, is billions, billions of investment. But Gillian has no clue about such things. Um, I, I worked for Stato, the Norwegians now uh, Equinor um, and every barrel counts their, uh, their sovereign fund the sovereign wealth fund uh, as of August in 
this year. That was the last time I checked it. It had over $1.7 trillion in assets and had about 1.5% of all the world's listed companies on its, its, its books, making it the world's largest single sovereign wealth fund in terms of total assets under management. It was so big that they split it into two. And when I mean, this translates to over 300 grand per Norwegian citizen, and it also holds portfolios in real estate and fixed income investments, um, and many, and it, it and it excludes company investments um, because if the company was unethical, so it, it it invests in what the people believe in, and for the people, and that that's what we should be doing. And you're you're right. This this is a hedge fund, the Great British Energy or GB Energy or GBE. I mean, this is this is a government investment body and publicly owned energy generation company that forms part of Labour's plans. This is Labour's plans for Labour, the Labour Party's energy policy. So yes, the Labour bring a private equity fund to the people for the benefit of, well, the investors. <laughs> Good job, Labour, you total turncoats, total turncoats. The, ragged tr the days of the ragged trousered philanthropists are long, long gone. Yeah. And it's no coincidence that the day that Ed Miliband signed this uh, shyster deal, um, he also announced that everybody agrees with me, I can't help you, oh, you can go to college, see you later. Um, and the SNP are aiding and abetting. Shame upon you. Absolute shame upon you. And on the Norwegian, I, I read an article recently where if they, if they stop producing oil and gas tomorrow, Norway could look after the next five generations um, without having to borrow any money. That's where we are, and our people are living in poverty. It's just we need to waken up and get moving. Um, here's the other thing uh, this week on that, Eva. We know that this is a hedge fund. We know that they've built a super highway to take our wind and electricity power down to England, but they've come up with a new wheeze that Billy Band uh, talked about when he was up. They're going to build a series of hydro dams to feed power down into England. Who's going to get the jobs? Who's going to get the Who's going to get the profits? Who's going to benefit out of this? And what will Scotland get? Um, a rhetorical question, either. But I think you know what the answer is. You know, every week I listen to Phil talking about oil and gas, and I ask myself, why is Phil not an advisor to the Scottish government? There is no logical, rational, sensible explanation for that. And I, I look at the wider picture and I say Scotland has produced some of the greatest minds in engineering, science, medicine, the humanities, the arts, you know, across the board, Scotland has produced people who are capable, knowledgeable, who know their own jobs and their own fields inside out. And you could stick half a dozen Phils and Lloyds and Allens and Roddies in a room and in the space of a couple of hours they would redesign the Scottish political landscape and they would create a roadmap to independence and a roadmap, a route to prosperity. The reason that doesn't happen is we've got a mediocre government who are thrilled to Westminster who don't want to make Scotland prosper. Now, in terms of where does Scotland go from here? You know, we used to laugh about this. There was television adverts about it. You know, they've even put ice in our whiskey was a thing, along with the, you know, chicken for, what was it? Pea and ham fair chicken. All these old fashioned adverts, but it's coming true. You laugh about Nessie and you're thinking, well, I wonder how many dams are going to create in Loch Ness, for example, because this is all about what is good for Westminster, what is good for England, what bolsters the popularity of the current Labour government, what is it that they need to do to create a diversion or create a headline or just bum themselves up. When what should be happening is we should have folk like Phil or Lloyd or Anne-Marie Ward or Dan McGarvey, people who know their game, who know what they're talking about, who know how to change Scotland for the better, these are the people that should be in government. And I would draw an analogy with football. 
we watched the Portugal game the other night and we were all beside ourselves when the entire um, audience, you know, thousands of people there applauded for a minute for Alec before the game started. And you think back to the glory days of the Scottish football team and you think about Jock Steen and you think about who he played and where he played them and why he played them where he did. And you knew he stuck Joe Jordan up the front because Joe wouldn't always get the ball, but the chances were that if he fumbled and kicked and elbowed other folk out of the road, he would be able to jump up and header the ball. And one day, somehow, maybe one time out of 50, he would hit and he would score and the ball would be in the net. He played Peter Lorimer where he did because he had the greatest right kick and the power of that leg and the power of that man was such that even if he had one tiny wee chance, there was a pretty high chance that the thunder and the ability behind that would hammer it home. This is what Scotland needs, a team of people who are able and capable to deliver, to hit the net, to fire the ball in the back of the net and to do it time after time and to know what they're doing and to be empowered and able and capable to drive the country forward. Instead of that, we've got, we've not even got third rate, we've got fifth rate people in jobs and in positions that should not be there. They're there through loyalty. They're there because they're face fitted. They're there because they've come up through the ranks. They had the summer job. They had the interns position. They got a council position. They became an MSP or an MP. And I go back to, they are no fit to lick Alec Salmon's boots. They didn't understand what politics is about. They don't understand what the movement for self-determination is. They don't grasp, they don't get what it is about Scotland and the independence cause that is so urgent and so important. And this issue about Britain coming into Scotland, Brits invading Scotland to steal our water, to harness our water, is an extension of stealing our oil and our gas and our wind and our whiskey and all of our resources so that the money that Scotland earns from Scotland's potential goes into Westminster's coffers and we get back a fraction by way of pocket money. That is not how you would live your life as a responsible adult. You wouldn't go to your work and give the guy next door your wages and put your hand out for a wee bit coming back to you to look after yourself and buy yourself a pie and a pint on a Friday night because that's what's happening with Scotland and it is high time the people of Scotland were served by politicians who told them the truth and said, this far and no further will you go. Scotland's resources are not for sale. Scottish resources are here for the good of the people of Scotland who should be better served by those they elect to represent them. Yeah, here, here, well said. Yeah. Here's the thing, Alan. Should not Gillian Martin, instead of signing up smiling and signing this off, should have turned around and said to Miliband and the English Labour government, go take a flying hike to yourself. We're not saying that we're not buying into this. And let me tell you now, we will, we, will, we will take this back when the time comes. We should have told them to get this. We should not be cooperating with the English government, should we? No, we shouldn't be. I mean, what we should be doing is implementing what Nicola Sturgeon said she would be doing and having a Scottish national government company, energy company. Not so as we could make so much power in Scotland, then flog it off at extortionate prices, which is what GB is going to be doing, let's be, let's be honest. The companies are still going to be charging extortionate uh, amounts for it. <laughs> but we should be able to, we produce so much energy we could give free electricity and gas to every single citizen in our country and still make a profit from selling it down south and abroad. That's what yeah. we should be doing. But our problem is our politicians believe civil servants are gods and their advice is the scripture. Very rarely do you get a politician that will turn around to a civil servant and say, no, you will do it my way because I'm telling you my way will work. Alex Sam mm -hmm. did it. He did it yep. many times. That's how we got the Queen's Ferry Crossing built on time and under budget. Because Alec didn't take all the advice from the civil service. He told them what they will be doing. And that's what we need more of. We need politicians with a backbone to take on not just the Westminster Parliament, but the civil service who work. And let's not forget this. The Scottish <laughs> civil service works for the English Parliament. 
They do not That's work it. for the Scottish Parliament. They have a vested interest in every single uh, a piece of advice they give our elected members. So it's time our elected members start using their backbone and their brains and start questioning them. Yeah, Alan's absolutely right, uh, Phil. I go back to you being our expert. But we could not only could we be giving our, our people free gas and electricity or reduced, I mean, whatever, a very cheap price, but we could be encouraging in industries with lower energy prices than anywhere in Europe. We could be really building up businesses, not closing down refineries and closing down smelting plants and shipyards. We could be encouraging business in with cheap energy prices. I mean, Germany is, 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 is in the verge of collapse because their energy prices have skyrocketed because they don't take Russian en cheap energy anymore. But we could capitalise and create so many jobs, could we not? Absolutely, and uh, the potential is massive, absolutely massive. So uh, we are just not taking advantage of that. It's as simple as that. We are, we are so. We're, we're, <laughs> you cannot do anything unless you're in control of your own destiny. We will continue to be a plaything of the billionaires and those who lord over us until you stand up and be counted. You know, and, and uh, Alan's right, you know, Nicola didn't go as far as, as in, in what she said. I would have went much further with a, a Scottish energy company, more in the lines of Statoil and National Energy or Equinor, as it currently stands. Uh, but of course she didn't, because you could do that with pretty much everything Nicola said. You can answer her as Kevin Bridges would. Did you? Aye. Did you? Because you didn't. You're, you're just full of crap. You always were. And uh, you're a traitor. You're a traitor. You completely betrayed us. We've got, in pump storage is, um, that, that we were talking about, there's a couple of things that have come out recently that is part of this. Because this is what modern um, hydroelectric is all about in dams. It's um, We've got, there's, there's loads of potential. If you've got mountains and water, you can do pump storage, right? <laughs> and that's Scotland, all right. So there's croaking. Um, if you look at, uh, we've got lots of opportunities, plenty of shovel ready uh, pump storage potential. Croaking's a, a pump storage w w facility, which, and it, it, what's great about it, you get immediate backup. See, when we talk about the, the intermittent nature of, um, solar and wind. It's why you can never have more than maybe about 8 or 9% of your energy from uh, wind and um, solar. Although you can have more if you're using, uh, if, you're, if you're exporting it and selling it um, across the sea or to other, other users. But we've, we should be expanding and building for ourselves, not for anyone else. Um, like Loch Ferna in Glengarry, uh, Kruiken, and you can basically you could up, you could you could you could switch Kruiken on and get 440 megawatts in 30 seconds, and you can maintain that maximum production for more than 16 hours at Kruiken as it stands. And if you expand that, we we, we could we could power ourselves with. Uh, pump storage because what happens is uh, during the night time when there's no when the energy is so cheap or maybe the wind's blowing at night and nobody's using it or the wind's blowing you can use that to pump the water back up free <laughs> and then when you need it to hit a uh, base load and certainly peak load that's when you would use it and you've got a uh, loch fern as well and if you look at the scottish but the, the, the only problem i've got here the only problem is it's Gilks Energy from Cumbria that are looking at uh, Loch Ferna. It's Drax, which is a private energy company that came about after the privatisation of energy in 1990 when the electrical the electricity industry of England and Wales was privatised under the Electricity Act 89. Drax came out of that. That's who. That's who's looking to invest in Scotland. Why? For the benefit of Scotland? No. For the shareholders. Look at even Scottish Renewables. Eva's buying on the money. This is not a company for Scotland's benefit. It's there for its owners. Britain is stealing our energy, our water, our resources, including the gold. There's gold in the hills. There is. There's gold in there in their hills. And that's getting stolen too. So there's six projects currently under development in Scotland. If you look at the Scottish Renewables website, which will, will more than double the UK's pump storage hydro capacity to 7.7 .7 gigawatt read that one again double the UK's pump storage hydro capacity so Scottish renewables is not there for the benefit of the Scottish people but when you look at that I mean it is 15,000 jobs it is 5.8 billion for the UK economy by 2035 so Scottish renewables and 
Uh, it's just it's not Scottish renewables. It's like the Bank of Scotland. You move the headquarters south, you buy it, and they 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 trade on our name, our good name internationally, and they steal from us. That has got to stop. Correct. See, not on here, folks. We're not only telling you what's wrong. We're telling you what we can achieve and do if we reach our goal of independence. And while we're talking about these creating jobs, free electricity, gas, whatever, Eva. What's, what's Starmer's latest thing? He's decided to start giving unemployed, obese people drugs to thin them down so they can get out to be good worker drones. That's the alternative. Free gas, electricity, or you can take some drugs given to you by your government to get you back to work. It's disgusting. You know, sometimes you just stop in the middle of this maelstrom and say, what did I just read? Mm -hmm. And you rewind and you go over it again and you're... Seriously. Now, when Phil's talking there about energy, it, it's reminiscent for me of a position in the 1960s when I was in primary school and we were taught about hydropower and about water and how water could come down a hill and it could power a turbine and you could turn it into electricity and you could store it away and the water went back up the hill and it came down the hill again the next day and it very simple no rocket science but children like me in primary two and primary three were drawing pictures of what a hydroelectric power scheme looked like I was lucky. My dad worked in them. He told me about them. I could go to school and tell my pals. Well, my dad was there and he did this at Loch or wherever it was that he went. And in terms of where does that thought process take you? You wonder, well, why is it that Scotland can create this energy on the one hand and be bursting with potential? And you look at poverty statistics and you look at mm -hmm. the numbers of working poor and you understand that there is at least a million people in Scotland living in deep poverty, of whom a quarter are children and three quarters are adults, and they're either working for low wages or they're on zero hours contracts or they're being shafted by employers because they pay them a low wage that is so low that they still qualify for means-tested benefits, particularly universal credit. Since when was it good or right or decent that somebody worked a whole week for a, a pauper's wage that left them so skint they were still entitled to a means-tested benefit? You know, that is offensive in the extreme, particularly so when you see the level of the profits and the incomes of the fat cats at the top, the fat cats that Labour are steadfastly refusing to tax until the pips squeak, which is what they should be doing. They were about redistribution. What they were not meant to be about was punitive action on the most vulnerable. Now, get to the point. Injecting yeah. people who are considered to be overweight and unhealthy and unable to work because they're fat. Seriously? The drugs that the Labour Party are talking about prescribing to people who qualify for benefits are drugs that are currently being trialled. The Labour Party has accepted millions of pounds in funding from medical companies, drugs companies, in return for using these drugs on people who will be guinea pigs. Come here, have a jag. You'll lose a few pounds, you'll lose a few stone, you'll be able to go out to work and you'll keep the wheels of industry turning. I have rarely heard anything so fascist, right-wing, dictatorial, unduly punitive and completely wrong-minded. People who are skint become overweight in large part because they are skint, because you need to feed yourself properly, you need a house, you need a cooker, you need dishes, you need pots, you need an electricity supply. You need to have the ability and the confidence and the money to go out and buy the food to fill your cupboards. If you don't have all of these things, what you'll do is you'll go to McDonald's and you'll spend 99 pence on a cheeseburger and chips. 
and you'll get fat because what you're buying is crap food that's full of shit basically but that's in large part why people who are skint are overweight and unhealthy it's depression it's mental health issues and it's a huge huge area that a government that was a responsible government would be looking at properly they'd be speaking to the folk who know what they're talking about not poverty sars or expert advisors who've got a hand in the till at the same time as the other hands collecting the funds that are coming out of the till by way of the return to big pharma because that make no mistake is what this is absolutely it's quite disgusting alan that, and it's the labor party that's the bit you've got to keep repeating to yourself the labor party now i'm old enough to remember when it was a labor party and it was for the workers but it is quite fascist as eva says to be injecting people and, and if they don't accept the injection then they'll probably stop their money whether they want to take this injection or not because they've made a promise to a, ph a pharmaceutical company it is fascistic and it's disgraceful is it not yeah but not unsurprising with the labor party i mean that's what the labor party are now i mean how many of them are highly invested in the pharmaceutical companies which all these drugs will be making massive dividends for each and every one of them now one of the problems that we have in this country is not the unemployment it's the underemployment i mean we have so many people having to work two or three or four jobs just to exist and what's the Labour Party's proposal on this? To remove zero-hour contracts. But what does that mean? Does that mean you've got to be guaranteed one hour a month to work, two hours a month to work? There's no detail. They're minimum wage. Will they introduce a minimum wage that will take people just over the threshold that they would have been on by receiving the universal credit? That doesn't help people. Because that's just putting them to exactly where they were in the first place, still in poverty. And here's what a lot of people don't actually understand. Some people who are overweight isn't because they're overeating. It's because they're undereating. And their body's metabolism changes their carb uh, the, the carbs into fat as storage because the body requires the nutrition. And that's what happens. And once you start into that process, it's hard to then reverse it again. That doesn't need medical intervention on that. It needs to be, people need to be fed properly. They need to have the finances to feed properly. And maybe here's a radical idea. Increase wages to living wages so as people can actually afford to live properly. Remove the charges for gyms so as people can actually go and have some recreational time. Have contracts of employment that give people some social time to enjoy with their family and recreational events so as they can do plenty of exercise as a whole family. That's how you deal with obesity. You don't inject people with uh, drugs that have just come on the market and experimental. That is just fascism at its worst. It is indeed. Now, the clock's beating as usual, Phil, and there's one other thing I want to get in, and it's out, out, out with Scotland. And I hope folks have enjoyed what we've tried to tell you about what we can achieve and what we should achieve. If we get our act together very quickly, we could actually be free by 26. But I'm, I'm, I'm struggling with the world, Phil. I, I, I'm watching what's unfolding in Palestine, and I'm hearing our government and the other Western governments telling me it's self-defence for Israel. I'm watching Israel bomb five countries, and I'm told let's say, they're the victim. But what got me this week, and I don't know how we can continue, is a hospital tent with people in it being burned alive and our government are telling people to do that. Can, is there any red line that will stop the slaughter? This uh, appears not, and it's down to us as human beings. Um, get the truth, the truth will set you free, is the, is the phrase, and, and, and it, it matters. This is why we have to speak up for what is right. This is why we have to make sure that our people get to see the truth of what we have become. Who we, who, who, what is done in our name? Let's face it. This is done in the name of the West, and the leaders that we have are acting in this way and promoting genocide. 
that's what's happening. That That is being done in our name. And if you want to stand by, I mean, we're reminded of that big, that famous photograph in the late 30s, uh, uh, early, it was late 30s, of all these people, a Nazi rally, giving the Nazi salute, except one guy standing with his arms crossed. Be that man. Stand up. You, you have to speak, no matter what it costs you. No matter what it costs you, the price of not being human, you can't afford you cannot afford, and and go, and go back to all of this. This just ties in. It, it 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 should enrage, disgust. Look to heroes. Look to alternative sources. We should do that more open. Often we should list those who are telling the truth, or an alternative to let people make their own mind up. Our people are not stupid, but we are being lied to. We are being brainwashed. And if you're only seeing one side of the argument, um, you will not have an objective view of what's actually going on and this is why they they come after individuals like um assange like salmond like uh, craig murray anyone who stands up for what's right in principle or, or even this program um and i'll look at the everything we've just talked about this this fa fascist corporate pandering by a right-wing unionist political party is there any other kind the Labour Party. I, they're saying, I have lots of new jobs. As one woman said, I've got three of these new jobs, but I still need to use the food bank. And the drugs are not for our National Health Service, as Starmer lied when he said it. No, it's not. It's for the drug company profit. Eva's right. We know big pharma's influence this. Uh, and, and the guy should be barred from ever setting foot in a Scotland which leans towards... Um, uh, socialism and we are becoming more and more Americanized. The Americanization of British politics and I'd, I'd end on one point. One of my heroes um, George Carlin and it's, it's the American dream there's an excerpt, I looked it out because when you were talking, when Al was talking and Eve was talking about injecting obese people to go back to work and to become obedient workers, this is an extract from George Carlin's American Dream. I would urge anyone who wants to understand what's going on, because I was asked this question at Westminster, um, can you give us a five minute summary of what politics is all about? And I went, no. But I know someone that can. He's called George Carlin. It's the American Dream because you've got to be asleep to believe it. And here's a small quote for it. You know what they want. They want obedient workers, obedient workers, people who are just smart enough to run the machines and do the paperwork and just dumb, just dumb enough to pass it passively accept all these increasingly shitty jobs with lower pay, the longer hours, the reduced benefits, the end of overtime and the vanishing pension that disappears the minute you go to collect it. And now they're coming after your social security money. That's an American one. Uh, they want your retirement money. They want your pension. They want to give it, they want it, want it back so they can give it to their criminal friends on Wall Street in the city of London. And you know something? They'll get it. They'll get it from you sooner or later because they own this place. It's a big club and you ain't in it. You and I ain't in the big club. And that's the bottom line. And we need to wisen up to that and do something at, dumbed about it. And as an independent Scotland looks after the, the values, the principles that that hold us dear, that Alex Salmon lived and died for. These are the principles of which I am I am I, I aspire to. I like he am human, fallible, make mistakes by God, and I'll make plenty more. But one thing's for sure. I, I went into politics for the people because I took a massive pay cut, unlike most of these shysters, and I would do it again. I would do it again for the right reason, to free our people from the fucking poverty. Sorry, the poverty is disgusting, absolutely disgusting, and we need to, we need to man up and woman up and make our, our voices heard and make, it, make our uh, opinions count. Yeah, yeah, well said. And for the Pearl Grab, I don't want to go here. Um, but just another thing I'd just say before we go, hydro was another Scottish invention, folks. We invented it. It was us again. Us that are too stupid, remember? Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed this as much as we've enjoyed, or if you can say that, enjoyed. It's not really the right word. Um, paying respects to, to a great man, a great Scot. Um, until we see you and yours, please, please take care.